guys. How are you, Ruth? I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here. And I have to tell you, I read uh, The Reckless Girls on the Plane on the way here, and I was gripped. We had a bit of turbulence. I didn't even notice. I was <laughs> face down swiping pages. So, <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. I, I joked when I wrote that book that it was like meant to be read on planes. I wanted people to pick it up in airport books uh, shops or whatever. So that thrills me to pieces. Thank you so it much. Worked perfectly. <laughs> well, excellent. Excellent. And I am so excited to be here uh, talking with you today about the It Girl. As I have said on Twitter, I am genuinely a, a big fan girl. I have been since long before I started writing thrillers. So this is really a treat for me. And, uh, and I'm so happy to get to talk about this book in particular with people because I think people are going to absolutely lose their minds for it. So, <laughs> so yes, for all of you joining us, I am Rachel Hawkins. I am the author of The Wife Upstairs and Reckless Girls here behind me. Um, and I also have another thriller coming out in January called The Villa. Uh, I also write paranormal rom-coms under the name Aaron Sterling. So I have a book out called The X-Hex and another one called The Kiss Curse coming out in October. So I keep one foot in kissing land and one foot in murder land, which is, you know. Perfect combination. Balance. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I'm delighted to be here today talking to Ruth Ware, who obviously, if you're here, you're a fan, so you probably already know, but I'm going to give you the, the pocket bio. So Ruth Ware worked as a waitress, a bookseller, a teacher of English as a foreign language, and a press officer before settling down as a full-time writer. She now lives with her family in Sussex on the south coast of England. She is the number one New York Times and Globe and Mail bestselling author of In a Dark, Dark Wood, The Woman in Cabin 10, that is my personal favorite, just throwing that out there. Uh, the Lion Game, The Death of Mrs. Westaway, The Turn of the Key, One by One, and the new one, The It Girl. And we are so happy to get to talk to you today, Ruth. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So now where are you? Because you're on tour right now. I am book, on tour, so. yes. I'm currently in a hotel room uh, in Cleveland, which it turns out is a beautiful city. I've never so been there before. Um, so yeah, I'm only getting like 24 hours in Cleveland, which looks like it's not going to be enough, so. <laughs> but hopefully I'll be back, so, but I'm so happy that we could do this virtually, because I just think one of the, you know, not much good came out of the pandemic, but one of the things that was nice was that virtual events really took off, and people who are not able to get to bookstores for whatever reason are able to see authors speak, so I'm really happy that, you know, we could, we could do this. Yeah, same. I've I've really been, I had that exact same thought where at first I was like, oh, I really miss getting out there and, and seeing readers face to face. And I still do. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it was just the coolest thing to be able to do stuff like this, where it just, it's so much more accessible to so many more people. And I just think that's such a cool thing. So yeah, and I'm really glad. Of both I, worlds going forward. Yeah, yeah. It's nice that they're not just like ditching this kind of thing now that we kind of can get out in the world again. So um, and it's nice to be catching you at the early end of book tour, because I know that towards Before the end I'm of book drawn tour, and exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Before you've reached the like crying into room service Chardonnay part of book tour, is that just me? Maybe that's just my vibe. I don't know. <laughs> Looking no, at pictures very, of my much, kid, very much so. universal. So no, I'm still at the fresh face. This is so exciting stage. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Which is excellent. Well, so for those of you who are joining us, uh, just, you know, I used to be a teacher as well. So I'm like, let me set expectations. Let me give the rundown. Uh, Ruth and I are going to chat a little bit. I have some questions for her and, and talk about the book. And then we're going to move to audience questions. Some were submitted beforehand. And then also we'll have the Q&A. So if you have a question, want to drop it in there. Um, I will try to get to some of those as well. So as we get started, Ruth, I think the first thing is tell us about the book. Tell us about the It Girl. Well, so because this is one of the first events I've done, I'm still kind of perfecting my, my pitch. So you're going to get the rough version. Um, <laughs> so uh, the main character is Hannah, um, and she is living this fairly idyllic life in Edinburgh. Um, she works in this cute little bookstore called Tall Tales, um, and she's married to her college sweetheart, Will. They're expecting a baby. Um, but Hannah's tranquil existence is rocked when um, she gets a phone call from her mum and it's to let her know that this guy John Neville has died in prison and what we find out is that 10 years earlier when Hannah was at Oxford University 
her roommate, April, was brutally murdered, strangled to death. Um, and John Neville, who was the college porter, was convicted mainly on Hannah's evidence. Um, so Neville has been in prison for the past 10 years and now he's dead. And it should be this moment of kind of relief and catharsis for Hannah. You know, a really painful chapter of her life is over. She can look forward to the baby that's coming with her husband. But actually what it does is force her to admit that she has been nursing some doubts over the past 10 years, doubts that she hasn't really allowed herself to, to, to kind of voice aloud. Um, and that actually she was never completely happy with Neville's conviction. And when a journalist pops up asking some pretty awkward questions, she's forced to admit that perhaps she made a mistake all those years ago, which means that um, A, she owes it to Neville to find out justice for him, but B, if he wasn't the killer, then someone else was, and they're probably still out there. So that's, wow. that's the kind of, that's the, the opening chapter of the book. Hannah, well done. No, that's a ten-year-old pitch. That was so good, Ruth. <laughs> like, I, and that is like, um, you know, it is definitely one of those books. And I mean, that's a lot of your books, all of your books for me. They they kind of come in with like that hook immediately. And I think like this one is so good at that. Like, you know, you're just immediately like, okay, I need to know everything that happened and some of my books know. definitely take a while to work up to the murder but this is not one of them right this like, is your like you're right page page one. <laughs> like, you know what's happened <laughs> now you mentioned that um you know Hannah's living in Edinburgh that she went to the University of Oxford um Edinburgh is one of my favorite cities on the planet I've I've been there six times I think I'm going back in December I just can't get enough of it um, so why Edinburgh for you? Like, is that, and Oxford as well, are those places that you have like a special connection to? I think Oxford came first. Um, I knew that I wanted to set the novel at a university. Um, and Oxford, I don't know how much people listening know about Oxford, but it has this very particular structure that it shares with Cambridge, which are the two oldest universities um, in the UK. Um, which is that they are, Oxford University is the overarching university, but the institution that students actually attend is their college. So you apply to the college and the college is a pretty closed system. So you have uh, tutorials in your college, you live in your college, you eat in your college, the tutors belong to the college and some of them live there, not so much these days, but um, right. when the book set, some of them were still in residence. Um, and you're, you're friends with people within college. So, and the colleges are small, like Magdalen College um, only has about 300 undergraduates. So you really can know everybody in your college, particularly everybody in your year. Um, so it's a great kind of atmosphere to set um, a mystery because it is, it's not quite closed room because 300 people is still a lot of people, but you know, the, these are kind of, these are walled institutions with a gate that is physically patrolled from about nine o'clock at night. So the, there's definitely kind of fun things that you can do in terms of, you know, who got in, who got out, who's got an alibi. Um, and a lot of the book is about um, like class and how people interact and Oxford being a very elite institution, but one that is wrestling with trying to become more inclusive and more diverse. Um, that was just all an interesting kind of undercurrent to the book. So Oxford started off as, as the place where um, Hannah and April were always going to go to university. And then I suppose I just thought about it from Hannah's point of view, like this terrible thing has happened to her. Um, she's being doorstepped by the press, she's been horribly entangled in the justice system, which has been this really hideously stressful experience. What would I do in her shoes? And I thought if I were Hannah, I would try to get away. Right. And oh, uh, Edinburgh is about as far from Oxford as you can get. Not quite, because there's still quite a lot of Scotland north of that, but you know, Scotland is a separate country, it has its own legal system, it has its own police system, it has a largely separate press still, they have Scottish versions of most of the newspapers, but they're staffed mm. separately and they cover different news. Um, and I just thought that if I were Hannah, that would be where I would go, it would be 
pretty much as far away as I could get without actually leaving the UK. Yeah. Um, and like you, I love Edinburgh. It's one of my favorite it's cities. It's beautiful. It's really atmospheric. Um, and I think something common to all of my books is that when I sit down and decide where to set them, I think about the fact that this is a place that I've got to spend a year in my imagination. <laughs> right, right. I wouldn't mind spending a year in Edinburgh, quite frankly. It's a beautiful <laughs> city. So that was a big part of it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I realized that like it was really during pandemic, like when I wrote The Wife Upstairs, that's set in Birmingham, Alabama. I live in Auburn, Alabama, so I'm about two hours south of there. And so it was very like familiar. And then man with like Reckless Girls, I was like, they're going to Hawaii. They're in a they're on a deserted island. They're going to Australia. And then the next book, I was like, they're going to Italy, because I was so tired of being trapped in my house. I think that's exactly it. After lockdown, we're just all desperate to get away and visit other places. And I was like, I can't go to Edinburgh, but I had again. <laughs> exactly. I think we're about to see like a big thing of like travel thrillers, basically. Like travel, but everyone's just going to go to beautiful, glamorous locations in their books because we couldn't for so long. Um, and that also leads me now into the, the next thing that I kind of wanted to talk about, which, and you sort of, you know, hit on this a little bit talking about Oxford, but like, there's definitely that kind of um, dark academia feel in this book, um, which I think like people always kind of go nuts for. It's such a classic vibe, as the kids say, um, a sort of secret history sort of feeling. Uh, what did you find sort of appealing about that kind of, that sort of story? Well, it's interesting because when I started thinking about this book, which was probably like two, three years ago, um, the whole TikTok or book talk phenomenon wasn't kind of quite such a thing. And I, I finished the book and was editing it. I was talking to a writer friend about it and he was like, oh, you know, book talk is all about dark academia. And I was like, dark, what? <laughs> <laughs> now it's like everywhere, like the hashtag is everywhere. Yeah. So it, was, it was kind of one of those weird on-trend moments where I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm not the only person who's obsessed with, you know, gothic institutions. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what I love about it, but I do, you know, I feel the lure as much as as um, any reader like the secret history is one of my favorite mysteries so, uh, yeah. and you know I think we all grew up or people from my generation grew up wanting to attend Hogwarts and you know, <laughs> may, maybe not with the health and safety record I wouldn't attend my <laughs> true you know uh, somewhere just beautiful and gothic and maybe it's just something to do with the fact that so many institutions these days are just like really utilitarian you know they're like school most schools their architecture isn't that cool and the yeah. teachers don't wear flowing academic gowns <laughs> Oxford is one of the few places where that is still a reality you know the dons really do still wear like all the proper dress when you do exams you have to wear academic dress and oh, wow. you wear a suit and tie if you're a guy and you have to wear like a skirt and everything if you're a woman if you go to formal hall you have to dress I mean it really is it's as close to Hogwarts as most of us will ever get right. um, and so that was just yeah I think it there's just something particularly fairy tale and also let's be honest a little creepy about that <laughs> it lends yeah, absolutely. quite well to stuff going wrong people going a bit crazy and yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely I do I think yeah it's that's it's got that kind of romantic sense to it it feels a little exotic you know a little glamorous yeah, um, absolutely. And also just in terms of, I suppose, like the reason I wanted to set the book at that turning point in Hannah's life, like the Oxford stuff was a bonus, you know, all the yeah. stuff. But I think the book is in part about two really vulnerable moments in a person's life, particularly in, in my life, I think. You know, the two points in my life where I really felt like I was sort of changing in a kind of butterfly chrysalis sort of way was leaving home to go to university um, and becoming a mum and when I was in my um, late 20s early 30s and that's that's the two points that Hannah is at in the book she's she's leaving home she's spreading her wings she's becoming independent um, and then 10 years later she's expecting her first child with Will and I think the thing about particularly the point where you leave home is that it is a really it's a time when you should be being brave and you know taking risks and 
having fun and and for most people it is but it, it is also a really vulnerable time because I think looking back at myself at that age I hadn't developed a lot of the tools that I use to navigate life now you know I feel like now I could probably cope with most situations life throws at me because I know who I am and I've you know kind of armored myself against certain situations I didn't have any of that when I was 18 I was like a little Labrador puppy bouncing <laughs> off into the world and I suppose that's in part that's what the book is about because Hannah is you know she's kind of unleashed on the world in this explosion of sort of hope and fear and trepidation and excitement and then something terrible happens just at the point where she should be spreading her wings and so she kind of draws back into her shell for the next 10 years um so that's I think that's really where the where the kind of the academic thing came from it was more a function of the plot than a than a desire yeah. to go romping around Oxford <laughs> obviously <laughs> But it works so well. And it's, it's so true. Uh, I live in a college town. And, and it's weird, too, because I, I went to college here and then moved away and then we moved back. And that kind of dissonance and almost about 10 years later, like, so it's a sort of similar kind of vibe and that dissonance of being like, man, like when I was 18, I was like wandering semi drunk down this street. And now, like, I think this is where I'm dropping my kid off for his play date. Those kind of like yeah. the way your lives kind of overlap in weird ways. And you're like, OK, so it, it is. It's so funny, like to, you know, feel like I'm surrounded by college students all the time, obviously. And you do you see that kind of that Labrador puppy quality. And so, yeah, I think it's such an interesting time and such a, a, a rich time. To, to visit in fiction, because you're exactly right. Like it's such a launching period. And then if something like a horrible murder happens, you know, that, that is gonna rock you back a little bit. Yeah. Um, and speaking of horrible murder, let's talk about our, our murder victim, April, who is such an excellent and like perfectly drawn character. Because oh, thank you. <laughs> she's oh I, I I loved and hated. <laughs> um, she's she's glamorous and she's interesting, but like she can also be, you know, really cruel or you know. And so, can you talk a little bit about creating the the sort of woman April is, who's also like too a very young woman, which you know is a thing I think to keep in mind. Yeah, well, I suppose part of what I was sort of nibbling around when I wrote the book was how we treat victims in the press. The press and the media and social media is quite a theme throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated by the way, when something bad happens to someone, we want to box them up in certain ways. And particularly when we're talking about victims, we either tend to treat them as completely perfect, you know, they were academically excellent they were had wonderful friends you know they're these sort of angelic creatures who were taken from us too soon or they're the cautionary tale you know the girl who went somewhere that she shouldn't or was wearing something that she shouldn't or was doing something that she shouldn't um and when they don't fit those narratives when people don't fit the narratives that we've assigned them we get quite uncomfortable and sometimes quite hostile and angry um, and I very much wanted, I'm always inspired by classic crime and, you know, I love it as a genre, it's one of my comfort reads, but I think the, the, one of the things that makes me slightly uncomfortable with it is sometimes the way it treats the victims of its stories, you know, there can be this feeling that the murder victim is this sort of slightly disposable cardboard cutout who's simply killed off in order to set the story in motion and let the detective do its thing mm -hmm. and I try very hard not to do that in my books I always want the person who is killed to be a three-dimensional real person who we the readers grieve and know that they left a hole in the lives of the people around them rather than it being like oh you know so-and-so's died jolly good well what's for tea sort of thing. um so in creating april i was really wanting to create someone very present on the page it's why i gave her the title someone who's at the heart of the book who we we can't forget for a moment um but also someone who it's very difficult to categorize you know she is as you you know, you summed her up really well. She's beautiful, she's glamorous, she's 
really fun. She's loving to Hannah. In many ways, she's a really great friend. She's loyal, she's creative, she's clever, she's interesting. But she's also really cruel sometimes. She's very dismissive. She's someone who doesn't have a lot of care for herself or for other people. She takes risks with her own safety, but also with her friends. Um, she's just generally a very complicated person who it's difficult to um, to box up as as a victim in any of the ways that we sort of traditionally think about victims. Um, so I suppose that's what I was going for, and that's why I tried at any rate to make her a really complicated three-dimensional person in the way that many of the people who I love as friends are complicated and three-dimensional and mm -hmm. and not always you know easy to be with but sometimes that's what you know you find most interesting about them exactly and I think that that like again that vein of like female friendship is so like I've, I've realized that it's something that I keep coming back to in my books it's in the wife upstairs it's in reckless girls it's a huge part of the villa where and I was like I guess I'm just never going to be done talking about like you know the ways in which and, and I think it's because I, I also like to fill my life with like cool and interesting women and stuff and for the most part I've been extremely lucky and none of them are are quite what some of the characters I, are. <laughs> I don't have an April like really <laughs> like maybe maybe a few years ago um but yeah I just I think it is I think it's like endlessly interesting and I think that it's so relatable and yet so specific at the same time, which, you know, those relationships always feel extremely um, lived in, in your books as well. Like, like you said, I think that you do such a great job of making them these really three-dimensional people that like, it's, you know, they're not just like cogs in a plot, which sometimes- I think that's exactly, that's exactly it. That's what I'm trying yeah. to avoid. And, you know, as you say, we've all got an April, maybe not as extreme as April is. Right, yeah. Both of us have encountered someone who we're simultaneously really drawn to, but also really exasperated by, and someone who we kind of recognise is good for us in a way, because, you know, April embodies many of the qualities that Hannah doesn't have, you know, Hannah, right, yeah. she's really loyal, she wants to do the right thing, she's super reliable, she's like, you know, she's basically all the kind of, um, you know, she's the friend that you would want to have, but she's not spontaneous and fun and risk-taking, and, and that's partly why she's drawn to April, because April has all of those qualities that she admires and maybe needs. But she also recognises that April is certainly not um, good for her in every every sense. And I, I think that's, you know, that's definitely something that I have experienced. But I think a lot of people have experienced, maybe particularly women. Right. You can have a friend who you simultaneously love and also know doesn't <laughs> you're a better person. <laughs> exactly. We've all been there. We've all been there. Um, and before I turn it over to like reader questions, I also that you know, leads into talking about, you know, you mentioned that like you didn't want April to just be this cardboard victim. Um, and that it is weird the way that we talk about victims, both in fictional murders and in real ones. And there's definitely um, a lot of talk like true crime right now with thrillers in the world in general. It's a part of this book, this idea of like true crime podcasts and people sort of being obsessed with like, you know, the the what do they call it like the missing white women syndrome you know where like certain victims get more attention than others um and was that something that you wanted to sort of talk about in this book as well like or sort of what are your feelings on on the kind of true crime explosion and, and how we talk about it as thriller writers I I mean it's fascinating I was I suppose it's not addressed in the book in that I don't talk about it, but I am sort of talking around it. And mm. certainly I think, you know, like lots of people over lockdown, I got really into podcasts partly because it was the, you know, it was a form mm. of um, something interesting that I could consume while also homeschooling my kids and cooking <laughs> meals and, you know, doing all the thousand and one things that I suddenly didn't, you know, had to cram into my day. Um, and true crime is all over podcasts you know mm. and they're really addictive and really well structured and, and lots of them are doing really crusading work in terms mm. yeah, of yeah sure. old cases and things that have been you know missed or or overturned um but there are also quite a few that made me as a listener really uncomfortable in terms of the way like you know that 
hosts sitting around joking, drinking cocktails, rating the most horrible murder. And I was like, you know, how would I feel about that? if I were the family or, you know, if I had some personal connection to this and this is my life that was destroyed and now it's basically entertainment for people, you know, commuting from A to B. Um, so I think, I don't have any firm answers on it, but I think that my unease about the sort of two different ends of the, of the genre kind of fed into the book a little bit and Hannah's certainly so the journalist who comes to her with new information about Neville's death um is an is a journalist but he's also a podcaster right and Hannah kind of talks through this unease to herself and her discomfort with the true crime genre um but at the same time he he's the person who forces her to face up to the fact that maybe there has been a miscarriage of justice um so yeah, it's it's not something that I have kind of clear cut feelings about. <laughs> no, same. That's why it's sort of fertile topic for books. Yeah, absolutely, and same. Like I grew up, you know, reading it. Like that's that was a big part of my reading development. It was like the first time I found like the Stranger Beside Me, the Ted Bundy book, you know, in the library when I was entirely too young to read it. Uh, <laughs> but hey, here we are. So you know, maybe it worked out. Um, but yeah, I do. I just I think that that whole thing is just so interesting. The ways in which like. Like you said, there can be uh, real crusading, really great work being done and also just like really tawdry entertainment and like, where's that line? And also I think something we think about writing fictional murder as well. You know, like you said, you want these people to, to feel like people and for their losses to somehow register. So yeah. I think you do a very good job of that. Um, so I'm going to move on to some questions. I'm, I'm cheating. I had to print them out. I couldn't <laughs> memorize all these fabulous questions. Um, but so yeah, these are reader questions. I'm also opening up the Q&A so that if there are a few questions in there, I will try to get to those as well. Um, I'm just going to hit kind of some, some high notes as I see them. Um, so Megan Peterson would like to know, and I would like to know this as well. Uh, do you know your book's ending before you start writing? Um, I almost always do, uh, not always every single detail, but I generally speaking know who did it and how, and usually the, the big part of the why, though sometimes the small details of the why get kind of fleshed out because I think, um, I try to think about my characters as much as possible before I start writing, but you always get to know them on a page in a way that you just can't in just by thinking about it in your head. Um, so it's often only when I'm writing a scene and they do something that surprises me that I realize there's some aspect of their character that I hadn't kind of uncovered before. Um, and partly because I think the kind of books that I write, I want, so hopefully as a crime writer, you fool the readers. It's very difficult because crime readers read a lot of crime. They're very much, yeah. <laughs> they get very, very good at spotting. You know, there's only so many ways to pull the wool over over somebody's eyes, and I think crime readers get very, very good at spotting when that is so happening. Smart. So I hope that I fool some of the people some <laughs> of the time. I'm fully aware that I'm not going to fool all of the people all of the time. Um, but you know, what I my ideal. Um, Kind of sensation when the reveal happens and when you know the reader figures it out is I want them to think of course you know of course yeah. it was I had all the information to solve this crime the clues were there tick 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 this now makes sense um, I don't ever want the reader to feel completely blindsided and cheated and feel like well ha huh, you know she never mentioned that kind of <laughs> right thing. right so I, and and for, for me to sow those seeds and drop those breadcrumbs, I have to know the solution to the mystery. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise I can't, uh, you know, I can't do it for other people, but I'm always um, endlessly impressed and delighted by how it's different for every writer. So now I want to know, do you, how do you, do you <laughs> sort of more psychological thriller books do you figure it out beforehand or yeah it's funny it's every time I think I figured it out um you know I wrote uh YA novels for years uh and so when I transitioned to thrillers I started I I had never really been an outliner but 
thriller writing made me an outliner because it was that same thing where I wanted to, I always say that like, I like my reader to be a step at least, maybe a couple of steps ahead of the characters. And I'm trying to stay a step or so ahead of the reader. So yeah, I like you, I kind of need to know where those breadcrumbs go. Um, but I feel like every book I've written, like I get to, to like towards the end and I'm like, actually it's gonna kind of go this way now. It'd be so much cooler if this happens <laughs> exactly exactly so i turn in these really detailed like 15 page outlines and then but i use it just sort of as a roadmap. so but i usually have at least an idea and i think for me it's always kind of because my books do lean more on like just the sort of like psychological mess with your head than like an actual mystery a lot of the time um, I think it is just kind of like, a, let's see where it goes organically, because I, I just like books about messy people being messy <laughs> sometimes. <I feel. laughs> sometimes their messiness surprises me. So yeah, it's, but I, I try to know like most of it <laughs> and yeah. then just, you know, like leave it open should something more fun occur to me, basically. Because I don't outline, although I know who did it. I yeah. I, I keep it all up here. So about a party yeah. I think to kind of help me keep it loose because I'm the kind of person that if I'd written it down, I wouldn't be able to use it as a roadmap. I'd be like, no, but the plan says I have to stick to it. <laughs> right. By not right. writing it down, I sort of give myself enough room to manoeuvre. Yeah, which I think is like the best way to do it though. Cause that way, yeah, it's like I said, I like it to be organic. I like it to be a little surprising, you know, and to sort of follow the things that feel better, I guess. Let's see. Oh, this is a really interesting question. Um, I'm this Carol is also a formal former teacher of ESL, and she wonders if you feel that the way you use language in your writing has been enhanced by that experience. Are you thinking a lot about words? <laughs> that is a really good question. Um, in all honesty, I don't think it probably has, um, but I do think that being an ESL teacher, uh, which it stands for English as a second language for anybody who doesn't know the acronym, um, made me much better at explaining things and probably better at presenting actually because um, the thing about teaching English as a second language is that the people you're talking to are absolutely as intelligent as you, they are, you know, whip smart, often more intelligent, um, but they don't speak English as well as you do, so you have to mm -hmm slow down, choose your words, explain carefully and get really good at communicating. Um, and I think that really stood me in good stead in all of my later jobs um, in terms of just having the confidence to pause a bit, to reframe a bit, to make sure that everybody is on the same page without hopefully coming over like you're patronizing their intelligence because right. they may not know the same words as you but they know an awful lot of words that you don't know so I think perhaps that's the biggest thing that I take into my writing is that I try never to underestimate the intelligence of my readers I try not to over explain often the endings of my books are left with a lot for the reader to put together themselves mm. um, but as a as a when I'm reading books I love that I love it when the the writer gives me that gift of trust and says here are the pieces I trust you to finish this or I trust you to figure this out or I trust you to decide what happens you know some of my books end almost not quite on a cliffhanger but certainly with questions remaining and I want the reader to to make up their own mind on that and to know that I trust them to do that. It's not that I've forgotten to, to fill in those blanks. It's that I think you, the reader, are the most important person in this equation and, and you should trust your own gut about this. Um, and I think that probably is something that came from teaching English. Um, just to yeah just to trust the intelligence of the person that you're that you're speaking to or in my case writing to <laughs> yeah I love that I love that I also used to be an English teacher although not ESL but I always say that teaching English um, it meant that I'm not scared of anything ever <laughs> like when they would send me to events they'd be like <laughs> 
there might be a hundred people there. Great. I will talk to all of them and none of them will use bad words at me. I'm hoping. So. <laughs> and the difference of course with doing author talks is that you know that everybody wants to be there. Whereas <laughs> the teacher, that is not always the case. Not true. <laughs> I don't have to tell anyone to put up their cell phone at one of my <laughs> signings. And I really appreciate that quite frankly. <laughs> Stop sleeping at the back. <laughs> exactly. Put your hoodie back. So yeah, glad, glad not to do that anymore. Um, there's, I'm going to get a question now from the Q and A. Uh, Shay asks, with so many books under your belt now, do you find it easier to do the research and write your books faster or are you still writing at about the same pace? Another one I'd like to know. <laughs> really good question. Um, so when I first started out and I too initially wrote YA, um, I wrote five YA books before I wrote the crime. Um, I was writing about a book a year and I had, um, really small kids. Um, my kids were, um, I mean, toddlers when I started writing. Um, my youngest was a baby. Um, and I was working um, three days a week in a, in a pretty demanding job. I was at home with the kids the other two days. Um, so I was really squeezing in the writing in my kind of, you know, my kids' naps and, and try bits in the evening and stuff. Um, and then as the kids got older and started to go to nursery and school, I had those two, three days a week when I could actually sit down and write. And then finally, when um, The Woman in Cabin 10 came out um, and I was touring all over the world and the book was in the bestseller list, I, I finally thought I, I have to give up the day job. Um, which was a real rich because I loved it um, and also I'm naturally a very cautious person so I was very very loath to give up a paycheck mm -hmm. um, as a writer you are painfully aware that yeah. you know you're only ever as good as your last book and that you have a you know a limited book contract um, so giving up that security was quite a big leap for me but um, at that point I just couldn't do both things well and I thought it, it's more important to me to do the writing well um so yeah so I went full time and I thought well this is great because now I'm full time I will be able to write two books a year and spoiler alert it turns out I cannot write two books a year so I think if anything I have got slower in terms of the amount of free time versus the amount of words I produce um but I think actually the truth is that the limiting factor is not the research or how fast I can type or you know any of that the limiting factor is how fast my imagination can figure stuff out and produce new characters and create new scenes and solve all of the dozens of problems that come up in the course of writing a novel um, and that seems to be pretty much fixed at a book a year and certainly when I was working in the day job, I would find that my most productive writing days were the days after I'd been in the office because obviously my kind of my subconscious had been sort of gnawing away at all of the mm. problems. And when I sat down at the keyboard, very often I'd have like an amazing writing day and just get like sort of, you know, 5,000 words done. Um, and now I find that it's more of a drip, drip, drip process. But interestingly, this book, um, and I think it was because it was written hard on the heels of lockdown, was one of my fastest books to write. Um, I, I probably wrote it in about four months, all told. And I think that was because I'd spent a year thinking about it, and thinking about these characters and plotting and solving and, and figuring stuff out. Um, and when I finally sat down to write, it was not quite fully formed, but it was much more formed in there in the back of my head than some of my other books when I literally sort of sat down at the keyboard and thought, Right, I need to write a book. <laughs> you know, I've got to hand something in in a year. What can I write? <laughs> what, what is it going to be? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, it, it was really hard not writing for a year, and I definitely I felt like oh, you know, absolutely desperate to get this book out. But I reaped it in terms of um, yeah, the benefits in terms of the, the actual writing being pretty fast when it happened. So yeah, yeah that was a long way of saying no. I don't think I do. <laughs> How about you, Rachel? Do you think your speed's... <laughs> no, my speed is exactly what it's been. Like, because it's the same thing. Now, I do two books a year now because I've got the other career as a romance novelist. Um, but that is not easier, been... yeah, like writing two different things. Yeah, it's because they're so different. It It's not as hard as I thought it would be. If I had to, I could not write two thrillers a year because it's that same thing. Like, 
Um, yeah, my friends and I always talk about it as the book needs cooking time. And so it may only take me like, you know, yeah, three or four months to write, but it's been cooking sometimes for two to three years before I've sat down to actually do it. And so I need that cooking time so much. And I just, you know, I wouldn't have, there's like no way that I could do two thrillers a year. I think I would lose my mind. Uh, and, and I don't think I could do two romances a year either, even though there's a million romance yeah. novelists who do like 12 books a year and they're all great. So kind of uses um, the same muscles. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's very nice to kind of have a, a break from one type of book. I, I try not to ever have to like draft or edit them at the same time though. I try to be like right now it's thrillers time. And then now it's romances time and so far the scheduling has worked out fairly well on that so, so yeah might be okay. taking tips here should i do yeah. that? <laughs> come write romance with me ruth it's really fun <laughs> <laughs> i'm having a great time like i said kissing and murder you can't go wrong it's like a one woman game of kiss marry kill only yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly every day um oh i get this one a lot too so i'm sure you have as well and people want to know do you base your characters off of people you know? And that is from Tamara. I do not, uh, partly because I value my friends. And <laughs> I think if I started to put them in books, I would quickly find I had no friends at all. Um, <clears throat> I suppose, you know, I do very occasionally borrow like very specific traits or words or, you know, or like it turns a phrase or something off people. But I would never take a, a real person from real life and kind of plonk them wholesale in my books probably the person that I base most of my characters off is me uh, which is not to say that any of my books are autobiographical um, but I always when I talk about creating character I think I talk about it in terms of like it's a bit like sort of creating a kind of Frankenstein's monster <laughs> you know you take a bit from here and a bit from there and a bit from that weird couple that you saw in the supermarket acting really strange and a bit from that old friend that you knew in you know grade school who like had this particular habit and you stitch them all together but the thing that makes it the thing that makes that character come alive is a little bit of you and there's a little bit of me in all of my characters even the most horrible ones in fact it's probably more in those <laughs> <laughs> they get to play and do all the things that i would like to say exactly to <laughs> the, the id unleashed as it were <laughs> um laurie would like to know have you ever thought about writing a sequel to any of your books um I would love to write a sequel in some ways because I think the great challenge of writing standalones is that you have to reinvent the wheel every single time and you have to come up with a whole new cast of characters and a whole new setting and a whole new feel and a whole new narrative voice and that starts to feel tough after a while. Um, so I would love to return to some of my old characters and revisit them and you know find out what's happening to them because I do think about them I worry about them and <laughs> wonder how they're getting along and you know that their marriage is worked out and if they're you know still drinking and <laughs> all kind of stuff um so it'd be nice to go back and find out although as a crime novelist the answer would probably be very bad in every single <laughs> um but I think the problem that I always have is that all of my characters so far anyway are pretty much just regular people and the age of the sort of amateur detective is pretty much over you know we can't have Miss Marple rocking up to crime scenes with her knitting needles and being allowed to shed DNA all over <laughs> the body and stuff so it just modern policing makes it very difficult to come up with a plausible way why a regular character could be involved in multiple murders um, so unless I came up with some inside the plot reason why the, another terrible thing should happen to this ordinary person, it's quite difficult to justify, you know, another bombshell falling in the lap of just a regular person. I feel like one is plausible, clearly terrible things happen to people out of the blue all of the time. Yeah. But for it to happen again and again is tricky. Uh, so yeah, that is what has stopped me so far, but I'm writing a character now, I won't talk about too much because the book is still quite ugly duckling, <laughs> who would be the first character who would have a professional reason to get re-involved in a crime? 
So yeah, watch this space, as they say. Interesting. That's why I always thought the um, the Dublin Murder Squad books, the Tana French, are so genius because it's the same like characters, but it's different police detectives in each book. So you're like, yes, each police detective can have the case of a lifetime. Yes. But you know, so I was like, oh, that is so smart. She's so smart. But yeah, same. Like I just, although I have started sneaking, like I snuck a character from Reckless Girls into the background of the villa and like, oh, you might yeah. not know, like if you haven't read Reckless Girls or you, you might have read it and not even recognize it. Yeah, but that's you know, a nice watch. little Easter egg for your oh, reading. Easter egg. So, and I've got a little reference to the villa in the one I'm writing right now. So I was like, that may be how I'm going to scratch my <laughs> exactly the rachel hawkins multiverse <laughs> <laughs> we are actually almost running out of time because we've been having so much fun so i am going to pick one more question off the q a and one more of the pre-selected and, and then we'll start kind of wrapping up let's see um oh okay this is a good one um from Let's see, there it is, okay. Do you always know beforehand who you're going to make the villain in your novels? Um, or does it happen more organically when you're in the writing process? Um, so I, yeah, I generally always know who did it, but the problem that I always have um, is that I, I don't think I'm very good at writing villains in the sense that I always feel very sympathetic to all of my characters, even the ones that I'm trying to make villainous. Um, and so often my villains start out in my head as being really horrible people. Um, and then I sort of find myself making excuses <laughs> for them <laughs> and kind of, you know, but they did it because of this and they're actually this. And um, so that is always my challenge. I always know who the, who, who the bad guy is, but sort of stealing myself to make them sufficiently bad is I think one of my problems as a writer. That's what, no, it's, that's what makes your book so good though, is because <laughs> it's exactly that. It's the, like they're full formed people, you know? And they're, like I said, they're not just, you know, and here I am to do the murder and be the bad guy. <laughs> like they, you I know- I can't they, see myself ever writing like, you know, Hannibal Lecter, but I would yeah. quite like to write, not Tom Ripley, but you know, someone of that yeah. ilk. And I'm not sure I'll ever quite manage to be sort of stern enough to, to write an anti-hero <laughs> as horrible as Ripley. <laughs> I love, gosh, I love that book. I love that character. I, that's one of those where I'm like, I'm sick, I did not write that, you know, 50, 60 years ago that I didn't exist to write. Yeah, we didn't before. get there first back in like- Damn 90. it. <laughs> Stupid, no time travel existing. Um, okay, and so I'm gonna close then on that. What are some of the things that you love to read? Cause that's one of the questions as well. And one for me as well. Um, yeah, what do you love to read? What are some of your favorites and what are you reading now that you've really enjoyed? Like, Oh, well, so the most recent book that I read was yours, which was great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I do read a lot of crime, um, partly because one of the nice things about being a writer is you get sent a lot of books to blur, <laughs> um, which is uh, both great and a curse because my sort of t pile of obligation is sort of, well, it's not even one pile, it's about eight piles of obligation. Um, so I do always have that slight feeling of I should be reading crime because I promise that I will read crime. Uh, yep. All these people that I will read it, um, but um, that haven't. Um, but when I'm reading non-crime, I have very um, Catholic tastes. You know, it could be <laughs> fantasy, it could be historical fiction. I love reading Patrick O'Brien. He's like mm -hmm. my, you know, the Napoleonic Wars guy because it's just so different from anything that I write. Um, and I love romance too. I really, um, I loved Seven Days in June. That was oh, so good. So good about the publishing industry. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, historical romance. There's a writer called Katie Moran who I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, just anything basically. <laughs> just point me <laughs> at a pile of books and I'll go. <laughs> no, I'm the same. And I also, I love historical fiction like that I never ever would want to write in a million years. Like, give me like a 900 page paperback like set in like 1283 and heaven yeah it's like heaven. such a kind of total change from what you write it's like a holiday <laughs> exactly exactly well thank you so much for being here today and everybody who's watching if you ordered a sign book from Barnes and Noble it will be to you in eight to ten business days and if you didn't order a signed book you can still get one at uh, bnn.com or your local Barnes and Noble 
um, and go pick up the it girl because oh my gosh it's so good like if this conversation did not you know let you know how good this book is let me just reiterate <laughs> it is so much fun you want to put it in your summer bag right this second and again Ruth, this was such a thrill for me because i really i've been such a fan so i've had so much fun talking to you oh thank you for great questions and great questions from the audience as yes well. this i was... feel like everybody gave me a workout today so. <laughs> Like this was like some deep thinking. People were really, you know, which is amazing. Like, like I said, the crime readers are so smart. So it's crazy how smart they are. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Rachel, for the awesome interview question. Well, thank you so much, Ruth. This was so much fun. And happy release week and safe travels. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Thank bye. you.